the thing for me that, that that's kind of at the crux of the matter is that we live in a networked age and it's time for us to upgrade our accounting practices to kind of digital era networked accounting practices. Um, standard, you know, uh, gap accounting principles, double entry accounting is inherently locked into the walls of a single organization by definition, because it's an offsetting debit and credit where debit and credit are defined by the type of account on the sort of, um, you know, equity liabilities side versus the um, expenses side of, and you have to have two internal entries. So for every time you take an action out in the world, like do a transaction, you have to create two internal entries that are offsetting each other essentially, you know, and that, and that's how double entry accounting works. And, and it only, so you, your actions out in the world are separate from what you're recording in a ledger. And you have to put these two offsetting entries in your ledger. And um, what REA accounting makes possible is um, that you do a transaction. Oh, sorry. REA means resource event agent accounting. It was introduced in the 80s um, by Bill McCarthy from uh, Michigan State University and some, some other folks and has become an ISO accepted standard. In fact, it's, that's not even a bad place to read about it. If you want to read the ISO standard, you can download their PDF. It's ISO standard 15944-4. And... Um, <laughs> It, it, that, that gives some pretty good overviews of how REA accounting works. But the idea is that for some economic agents, they can engage in an economic event that involves a flow of resources or multiple flows, often counter flows of resources, like money in one direction, resources in another direction. But it, it can even involve like, um, the economic agent having to do with moving inventory within a company from a warehouse to uh, another warehouse or to, you know, um, so it can model all types of economic flows, really. And actually, the flows word there, I think, is pretty vital in that some people who've done some really great work on the modeling of, of how to do REA transactions well are the folks at Value Flows, which is um, Bob Haugen and Lynn Foster at, at uh, Value Flows, where you just take the WS and put a dot in front of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and uh, that website can also tell you a bunch about like how to track value flows in REA accounting. And the exciting thing, just a little bit of a preview, which I think we should come back to after talking about Connor's stuff is the exciting thing to me about implementing REA on something like Holochain is when you put it in a immutable cryptographic system, what you've basically just done is have your transaction essentially be able to become your accounting entry as well. It's an immutable accounting entry and you don't have to do separate transactions and accounting in that regard when you do your transactions that way. And not only that, but if you allow, um, if you allow, so we, we've always recommended that people implement currencies on Holochain in terms of peer-to-peer -peer accounting. And REA accounting is an accounting standard for that, an accepted accounting standard for that. And what it kind of allows you to do is if you allow somebody to kind of borrow, to go into the negative, in their accounting balance for some of their business units. Let's say you you sell bushels of apples or cases of whiskey or uh, you know hours of of uh, web design services or something like that. If you are allowed to go into the negative, you are essentially advancing yourself money on a cryptographic ledger in existing business units where we already have context for the value of those business units. And it allows those business units to essentially act like a cryptocurrency. You don't need to issue some weird new token or coin. You actually have bushels of apples. It's just that 
right now it's not harvest season yet. And I'm pre-selling my bushels of apples and I'm going into some bushel of apple debt. And then I have to deliver the bushels of apples later when it comes harvest. And, you know, and if I, if I can do that through mutual credit I- issuance, which we can also come back to and talk about how that is different than typical fiat issuance used in cryptocurrencies, um, then uh, you actually have regular business units of account acting like cryptocurrencies that are definitely not securities. They're inherently utility tokens, you know, um, without having to create a token. They're actually just units of account. So that's kind of exciting to me is that, in fact, I, I wonder, especially as regula- re- regulatory environment gets a little bit more strict around cryptocurrencies and as things, as there's like a backlash from how speculative and volatile cryptocurrencies have been, I wonder if this isn't, if this doesn't provide like a way forward that kind of is an end, or, end around around all of the kind of restrictive regulations because you never have to create tokens. You're actually just doing accounting and accounting is legal everywhere. 